name is Ian Harrower, and music has been a part of my life ever since I can remember. I cut hair to make ends meet, and I'm looking for a change. So I'm taking my vintage Triumph motorcycle, and I'm leaving my job, my home, and my girl to take a journey across the U.S. to explore music. So follow me through big cities and small towns of all kinds, talking, listening, and learning about the music that defines and tells the stories of the people in the city they live in. So come with me, down the highway. Angeles Quest moves forward as we visit with Blaster's frontman Phil Alvin. Phil and his brother Dave started the bluesy, rockabilly influenced band The Blasters in the late 70s and hit the scene running with their brand of Americana. With Phil's loud tenor vocals and Dave's bluesy rock and roll guitar licks, they made a huge imprint on the early Los Angeles punk scene. I wanted to sit down with Phil and get his take on the Los Angeles music scene of then and now. In 2014, the Alvin Brothers reunited and released the album Common Ground as a duo. It was the first studio collaboration by the Alvin Brothers since the mid-1980s. The album was nominated for a Grammy. All right, we're here with Phil Alvin. Yes, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> Frontman of the Blasters, one of my favorite bands since I was very young. About 13 years old. I, think I wasn't first time. born then, man. Yeah, I know. That, how, did that, how did that work <laughs> yeah. out? How does that happen? <laughs> I, it's all right. The first thing I have to ask is kind of a generic question, but you can take, take it any way you want. How did you get started in music? I, my first memory of music is knowing that, as I learned how to talk, that, that I cried whenever Brahms Lullaby, my mother had a a wind-up box of a, of a uh, uh, you know, music box that was a porcelain piano and it played Brahms Lullaby. And I sort of came into consciousness knowing that that song made me cry. My first memory of actualizing music is very, very young. And we had a piano in the house and I remember crawling up on the chair, the bench, and <laughs> And I took my three fingers, and I don't know why I picked three, but I did. And I played three white keys in a row. And it didn't sound good to me. And I remember telling myself from the geometry, I don't know whether it was the sound or the geometry of my fingers, to skip every other one. And I found out that no matter where I did that, that it sounded good on the wow. piano. And that is my first memory of actualizing music. That's when the shape and the sound began to have meaning to me. Uh, that the, the shape, you know, and blind guys still have shape, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that the, the shape of what I was doing with my hands and the sound came very clear to me that that had something to do with that. How old were you when? I would have to have been three, I wow. think, or something like that. And I have, very, I have a very continuous memory of my life way back, I, 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 for whatever reason, you know, because I'm so clean. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's my first memory. Then I, I had a cousin, Donna, who I loved, I loved her, and my brother David also loved her. She was one of the reasons that we played music. She used to be our babysitter. And when we would go to her house and babysit, and she would have dance parties, record parties. And I was imitating Joe Turner and, and Elvis Presley and, and everybody since I was like five, you know. And uh, As far as singing is concerned? Yes, yes. <laughs> and, and one of the singing stories that I tell, because it's true, was... My sister is a couple of years older than me, two, two grades ahead of me. Not, she's, I think she's 18 months older than me. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to diss her. Uh, but 
I went to Catholic school, Our Lady of Perpetual Help in Downey. And uh, uh, my sister was a couple of grades ahead of me. And I knew that Sister Mary Antonita, the principal, she was the woman who led the choir. And I didn't know if I knew she led the choir then. I just knew that Sister Antonita was very, very strict and everybody was afraid of her. So we're in first grade and she came about the second or third week or maybe a month in of first grade. And I don't remember the song, but we had all been taught a song to, to sing. And she came in to give out holy cards, right? And so we're singing this song and Sister Antonita's in the front of the class. And she started walking, not down the aisles, across the aisles between the chairs. And she got to me and she said nothing. And she grabbed me by my wrist. I swear to you, this is true. She grabbed me by my wrist and she took me out of the classroom, didn't say a thing to me, took me off campus, crossed the street down the avenue over to a Victorian house that's across the street, still there, knocked on the door. A woman answered the door, who I now know is Mrs. Gibney. She said, hello, sister. And Sister Antonita, and I am freaking out. It's like, what did I do, you know? <laughs> and she has me by the wrist, not by the hand, by the wrist. Yeah. And she pulls me into the house, and Mrs. Gibney turns around. There was a piano right there. And Mrs. Gibney sits down at the piano and goes, bim, bam, bozo, bim, bam, bozo, bim, bam, bozo, bim, bim, bam, bozo, bim, bam, bozo, bim, bam, bozo, bim, bim, bam, bozo, bim, bam, bozo, bim, bam, bozo, bim, bam, bozo, bim, bim, bim. She says, now you do it. And so I did it. And, and I was the choir boy lead singer from that day as a descant. I mean, I was, you know, wow. I was in the Pope's choir then. <laughs> And until eighth grade, I had to make singing cool because I was not a goofy guy or any other than, you know, being me. And, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and Sister Antonita would stand there and if my stomach would go out while I was singing, I would get stuck with a ruler. Uh, and so my I breath control, it. It, and they taught, me, they taught me how not to make ugly sounds some of which I didn't agree with. They didn't like hard percussive sounds. Uh, and so you weren't supposed to be percussive. And I liked percussion and I, and I knew then, I, but they taught you how to make R's and H's and L's, these sounds that can be so ugly that, uh, and, and that was second nature to me. I mean, it just came up. I used to be able to, I probably still can, but not, not very well, but I used to be able to open up the choir book and read, you know, my, sing my part, you know, pretty much, uh, pretty much, you know, of course they didn't have much rhythm in the songs, but, <laughs> but I could, I could, I was able to, you know, read the song and, and, uh, and in second grade, my sister took accordion lessons from a guy called Wynn's accordion studio. And I wanted to play guitar. And so my mother found out that Mr. Wynn played guitar. So in second grade, you can see my hand. I have a pretty big hand. I've always had a pretty big hand. I went to Wynn's accordion studio with my sister who was playing, had a rental accordion, was playing it. And uh, Mr. Wynn looked at my hand and says, well, his hand's too small for guitar now. But let's give him accordion lessons. And when his hand gets bigger, we'll be able to have him go over to guitar. And so then I was tapping out this thing and playing this accordion. My father, who was a union uh, for the United States Steelworkers of America, who traveled a lot and was a public relations guy for them, who also was a very good musician, when he came back and found out that I was taking accordion lessons, not that he didn't want me to take accordion lessons if I wanted to, he said, let me see your hand, Phil. And I showed him my hand, and he said to my mother, who was called Nana, he said, Nana, this boy's hand is fine. The reason that he told you that was because it is cheaper to buy an accordion if you have two kids taking it than to rent to. That accordion is in the closet at my house right now. And, and then my father, I think probably when I was in fourth or fifth grade bought me 
for Christmas, a Orlando, you know, guitar. And, and I, I played it, uh, but my father also taught me how to play harmonica. Uh, and he taught me some, and he taught me how to use my tongue, which most harmonicas, I mean, they can level up, but I mean, I can, I can take the harmonica and just play, you know, with nothing. If I brought a harmonica, I'd prove it to you. Uh, and, uh, and, so, and, and so I played guitar very sparsely. I knew, I knew some chords and stuff, but I was then a harmonica player, and I was a singer, and I was a baseball player, and, you know, you're a kid. I had another cousin, my cousin Mike, who lives in Portland now, who got my uncle Lad, my mother's brother's banjo, and he was playing banjo and was... He's like four or five years older than me. And he was into Bob Dylan and, the, and, and Bob Dylan had played a harmonica. And it was not too hard to, to cover that kind of harmonica. So I would play the Bob Dylan melodies on the harmonica. And, and, and my cousin Mike would sing and I would play those songs. And one day he played me an album of Brownie McGee and Sonny Terry. Oh, I love and when I heard Sonny Terry, and I, I was probably nine or ten, when I heard Sonny Terry, I, it was like, well, where, where's this stuff been, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I made my mother, and, my, and I didn't make my mother. My mother was the best of mothers, and she would look for things, and she would take me, to, and it, I, anything I, I, I wanted, she would provide us. She drove everybody around. She took me to the Ash Grove when I was 12 years old because Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee were playing there. And I was, and I'm still a pretty ballsy guy, you know, but uh, Joe Turner used to call me the Charger. Send the Charger in, you know. <laughs> and and uh, uh, I went into the Ash Grove, and the first person that I met there was Big Joe Williams, Poe Joe Williams, the nine-string guitarist, uh, not, not the Kansas City, <laughs> but, but Poe Joe Williams, who was there. And, and he was so, and I was, I was a little kid, you know, but, and he was just so gracious to me, and what a great guy. And he told me he knew Sonny Terry and would take me back and introduce me to him. And so he did, you know, after the show, he took, oh, God, what? What a fantastic, I've known so many wonderful musicians that have been so good to me. Uh, and he took me back and introduced me to Sonny Terry. Wow. And I asked Sonny Terry, I said, could you give me lessons? And she said, yes, he would, $10 a lesson. And, you know, I say I was 12, so that's like 1965 or something, like, something like that. <laughs> and 10 bucks and and where he and, and brownie would stay when they were in town is at the lido hotel across the street from playboy liquors okay which is like you know that's where willie the pimp you know the, the frank zappa song is uh, yeah that. and my mother would drive me there and sit out and wait for an hour hour and a half while sonny terry would teach me harmonica i, I remember everything he taught me and I used to have all of these things on tape, you know, cassette tape, very early cassette tapes. Uh, uh, and, and Sonny Terry taught me how to play harmonica. And then eventually he said, you know, there's nothing more I could teach you. And I remember like the second or third time that, that I was there, Brownie McGee walked through and they had a, they had a, a you know, a love hate relationship, okay. like most guys that are in, that are tied in bands and stuff. Sure. Brian McGee walked there, he said, how come you don't want to learn how to play guitar? I said, well, I do. <laughs> you know, I love, I love. <laughs> and, and it was very, really, really a poignant scene. I, it almost makes me cry now. It certainly made me cry then when I played at McCabe's with Brownie McGee right after Sonny had died. And, and Brownie would play the guitar and he would and he, he would say the things that he would say to Sonny, and then he would say the things that Sonny would say back to him. It was, it was, it was beautiful, but, but very poignant. Uh, Dude, that's amazing. Uh, yeah, I've, I, 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 I've never really made the list, but I, I sort of was making a list in my mind of all of the musicians that I've met 
and and my God, I have met so many of the great these. I'm, I had breakfast with Duke Ellington at the Watts Labor Community Action Committee in Saugus. Uh, uh, I met Count Basie in the bathroom at the Downey Theater. Wow. <laughs> and, and, and he had just finished using the urinal. Man, I shook his hand and, and he, he, you know, he was he, and I, that was fine. And he signed this big poster of Count Basie uh, that was in David's room for many years. I think it's gone now. I mean, I don't think David still has it. Uh, I don't know what happened to it. But, uh, and as I was telling you, you know, Lloyd Glenn played right around the corner from my house in Downey. And since I was 13 or 14, I would go down there. The great Lloyd, most dignified man, brilliant arranger and piano player. And, and, uh, and he, the drummer was a guy named Rabon Terrat, who's the drummer and sort of the shout back guy on the song, open the door, Richard, open the door and let me in. And I would go, and I could walk there, you know, and ride my bike there. It's right around the corner from my house. But they would let me stay in the, this back kind of a booth. And then eventually they would just let me sit up there and I would talk to Lloyd Glenn, who, who was taught by Mead Lux Lewis. And, and they accepted me. And then at the Dixie Bell in Downey, even before I could drive, but uh, mostly that's probably around 15 or 16, that, that Al Morgan, the bass player, and Buddy Banks, the saxophone player, who also played piano. It was Buddy Banks and Al Morgan. Al Morgan is the bass player on the, uh, with Cab Calloway. He started on Fate Maribel's steamboat band when he was 15. He's probably, uh, Louis Jordan, Fats, uh, Fats Waller, he's probably best known as the guy that is playing the reefer man at the beginning of that Cab Calloway uh, right. six section of the reefer man. Man, that cat is hot. <laughs> and I, yes, and Al Morgan, and Al Morgan taught me how to sing Harlem jazz stuff and, 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 you know, St. James and Fred, he was just the greatest. He's also in that, the Gene Krupa story movie, he's the bass player that when they go to the jam session at Gene Krupa's now new place, just, just a point. And he's just about inevitably at any of the Louis Jordan, uh, uh, soundies or stuff, you know, that'll be Al Morgan on bass. And, and he was our manager for a while. Johnny Baz and, and other guys that play, they're all a year older than me. It doesn't look like it, but it is. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, there was a, a store, which now has got what, where Downey Music has moved, but it was called Humphrey Harmony House. And Doug Allgood, the uh, guy who lives in Texas now and still plays music, who was the bass player in our band, uh, and the band's name was Delta Pacific at that time. Uh, this is the band that you were doing with Johnny Baz and those Johnny guys? Ba Johnny Baz and I made a band in, in yes, in very... So let me, let me, that, yeah, let me ask you about go, that. Yeah, so, yeah, it's an interview. <laughs> well, I mean, well, there's a moment. No, I just, it, it, the people you're talking about are just amazing. And I can't believe it. beyond, like, before my time, people that I love now, but I have no access, sure. they're all gone. I mean, this... I, I thought, thought everybody was gone then too, but I, you know, I know, but, but they the, still were. I mean, it didn't Sun House made it to the 1980s? Yes, he, he did. He was I, like I, I never met Sun House. He was the one that you thought would be gone before all of them, and he made it to like 86 or 87. He lived to, to be yeah. his way into his 90s. But once again, I was eight, eight years old or something when he died. You know, already in the sure. music, but I didn't know about that stuff. So I, I wanted to stop you because the. At this point, you, you, you've kind of there was a moment in there, like when you met Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee, where I think you threw away, not threw away, but you're like, okay, reading music out of books and all this is done. I found these guys and now, you know what I mean? There's like that moment, like where you're singing yeah, in the so choir. Yeah, so reading music out of books, I, I sort of lost that before, but yes, I understand. But, th but then you saw these guys, you're like, this is what I have to do. I have to play guitar, play harmonica. These guys are playing this amazing music, blues and jazz and b boogie stuff and just amazing stuff. It was, is that... Was that the beginning of what would have started now your, your musical journey? Is that where you went, this is the stuff I want to focus on and start a band and play this kind of music? You know what I mean? Yes, that, 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 that is when, and I never considered music to be a, a career, and, and I still don't. <laughs> and, but, We're fooling ourselves if we do. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, 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 but I quit my day job. <laughs> and, You're lucky. But 
Yeah, you think so? <laughs> yeah. All my friends got pensions now. Uh, and oh, no. uh, yeah, uh, but uh, uh, yes, I tell you that John Baz's family lived across the street from my family. John Baz, the bass player in the Blasters. I, I was gonna, yeah, t- yeah, tell the folks out there and yes, <laughs> and, and who he was. Johnny and Johnny was a year older than me, so when you're little kids, you know that's a lot, you know. And and he went to Oil PH, and Johnny was always just. All the girls loved Johnny, and he was the best dressed guy, and still is, you know. And I'm quite the opposite. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but Johnny and I are—they moved away uh, to another place in Downey, and but my mother had taught his mother how to drive, and they were very good friends. And on occasion, we would go over to the Baz's house, and they had a pool. We have a pool now. We had a pool soon afterwards, but they had a pool, and and we would swim and. And my sister was friends with Debbie and and uh, Johnny's older sister mm-hmm. and and Johnny and I and and Clint his younger brother and David you know we're, we were all we all knew each other. When I was thirteen or I guess I would have been fourteen because it was between eighth and ninth grade. And Debbie Baz played guitar and I knew that and she was she did folk stuff and. And I knew the Bazes were also musical. Johnny Baz and I were at a party not far from here. And we were standing and watching a guy play the drums doing the Inagata De Vida drum solo, <laughs> which was us. Uh, I wasn't even old enough to have been to that many parties, but I was already sick of that thing. You know? <laughs> yeah. And Johnny and, and Johnny and I knew each other, but we weren't, we, we, you know, you were, the, he was a year older than me. and, and and uh, he was already in high school. I think he was at Downey High. He eventually came the next year to Pius, where I, where I went to. I was always went to Catholic school the whole, time, the whole time. And Johnny and I were sitting and watching this guy. And I don't remember whether it, was, whether it was I said to Johnny or Johnny said to me, I don't like this stuff. And I said, and whichever one of us said back, I don't like it either. And then Johnny said, I like the stuff they call blues. And I said, I like the stuff they call blues too. And I, I play harmonica and the canned heat existed at mm-hmm. that time. Sure. And, and we said, let's form a band. Johnny says, I play drums and he plays guitar. Johnny taught me as well as I think David. And Johnny, T-Bone Walker liked the way Johnny played guitar. Uh, uh, maybe more so than he liked any of the guys that were playing guitar in the band that Johnny played drums in. Right. We formed a band then and effectively that is the band that still exists today although johnny became the bass player uh right and uh and johnny and bill bateman the blaster drummer uh man they used to have to fight all after every blaster gig they would get drunk and they would fight because <laughs> you had you know there was a competitive thing and and to me and it's still somewhat true uh, bands were gangs, you know, when, when we started playing, uh, in Hollywood and stuff, and then David would go and play in the flesh eaters and stuff like that. It was like, that was just so foreign to me. You know, it was like, what, what, and music brings people together and we would have jam sessions, but when you played, you played with your band and that's your band. That's why the blasters is the blaster. And I still can't, you know, when, whenever we've had to get a guitar player or something, I can't go out and play until there is somebody who is the band guy, a guy that's in my band or, or that I'm in his band. And, and that's why, you know, I never put it out as Phil Alvin and the Blasters. Then where, where do I do a solo record? I would try to stay away off the, you know, I would do American music that we, so not was so much the Blaster stuff because that meant a lot to me. And Johnny and I were in this band. And Doug Allgood was in this band, this bass player, who worked at Humphrey Harmony House. And one day, a young black man named Ernie Franklin, Ernest Franklin, who was a photographer and things for the Times eventually, but at the time he was, he was Ernie Franklin, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> and he came into Humphrey Harmony House and was taking some guitars off the walls and was playing blues. And at that time, a young black man didn't play, they may have played, you know, I, I don't even, I don't know what you call this music, you know, but, uh, and Doug Allgood, who was kind of a tripped out guy, he says, hey, 
play the blues. That's pretty good. And he says, oh, yeah, his mom knows T-Bone Walker and Joe Turner and uh, uh, all of these people. And Doug says, well, we got a band. And he says, well, his mom is looking for someone to manage. His mother, Mary Franklin, who actually on my second solo record, uh, I had her come and sing the, a song with me. In fact, she sang two songs. She sang What's the Reason I'm Not Pleasing You and The Satellite Man. I don't know if you know any of those things on it. But so Doug called us and said, hey, we're going down to the York Club, which is in South Central. I, 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 I can't remember if it's on Florence or maybe on, a, on like 88th or something like that. I, uh, it may still be there. Uh, and And... I couldn't drive, and Doug Allgood had a, father had, he could drive, had a 32 Plymouth that was all decked out. And we all piled into this 32 Plymouth, and they were quite, you know, guys were saying, you think they'll let us in the bar? And I was saying, yeah, I think they will, you know? (laughs) Uh, And uh, so we drove this 32 Plymouth down, and we parked, and we walked in. And there was Joe Turner singing and i the guy on drums was a fellow named snow lee allen was playing sax this is when i met lee allen big jim Wynn was playing baritone sax uh johnny fair was playing guitar it was a you know it was a pretty big band and it was amplified sure and joe turner was up there singing and mary franklin Ernest's mother the one that was looking for a manager she met us at the door and said, well, you must be these, these young white kids that are coming here to, to, to talk to us. And she said, I'll introduce you to Joe when he gets off stage. So I'm sitting and listening to Joe Turner. My God, this voice is just going. And I was already imitating him, you know, before I'd, I'd seen him with the Johnny Otis show a couple of times. And, and I knew his records, you know, from, from, from my cousin, Donna. And, and Joe finished the the set and I saw at least two songs and then he came walking through the through the uh, door that led it from the bar into the to the uh, room and Mary said Joe these are these kids that I was and he says I'll be right back I forgot my microphone he was singing without a microphone with this band, you know, with the three-piece <laughs> horn section and all of this stuff. And you, you missed nothing from it. He drove over, he got his microphone, and he came back. Wow. And, and then we had the testicles <laughs> to go up, and I sang Wee Baby Blues in front of Joe Turner in my imitation of his voice. And Joe Turner and I became very close friends. And when I was 18, Joe Turner felt that we were close enough friends for him to say to me and this this was very meaningful to me and and to my singing and to my whole concept of myself and music was listen why don't you quit embarrassing me and yourself and sing in your own voice and I was it was pretty crushing you know as a as an 18 year old to have that frankness and it took about two weeks for me to, to adjust to that, because I was already getting wrecked by Dave Carroll and other Downey Oni guys, you know, the big man, yo, yeah, and, you know, <laughs> and I can imitate Joe Turner. So when Joe Turner told you that, you, the, the, the first form of the blasters was already going at this moment. Correct. That's why you were, now, did you go back and regroup with everybody and go, okay, I have to sort of no. figure this out? No, I just, I just, I just, I, I learned what it meant to sing like that in my own voice, which in a certain sense, and I don't want to, and I'm not saying that Elvis Presley was, uh, and Elvis Presley was a big influence on me uh, in more spiritually. Uh, in my cousin Donna, the first record I was ever given, and, uh, and I don't know, it was, I was very young, and I, it was a 78, RCA Victor 78, of Elvis doing Hound Dog, and the flip side was uh, uh, Love Me Tender, mm-hmm. okay? And I, I didn't like that song as much. I liked Hound Dog, but I did play it, and when I played it, then I, I liked it because I thought that Elvis was saying, 
all my dreams fulfill. <laughs> and I thought, what a nice guy, you know, what a great guy. I truly believed he was talking, you know, sure. and, and, and I thought he knew Donna and everything and, <laughs> and all my dreams for Phil. <laughs> and and it, when you sing in your voice, that my voice, that kind of music, there was, you know, it's immediate, you know, it's like Carl Perkins sang in his voice, you know, all these guys, there was plenty of people that sang in the voice. And that's why this notion of, of all of these names for this music was always so foreign to me. I don't, you know, when the, when the, when the blasters and, and uh, got known in the in the seventies and, and rock and Ronnie Weiser, you know, I, he, there was an article that David had read in the Times. David was always reading things. I don't, I, you know, I, I got all my stuff orally. I, I look at pictures <laughs> and books, but I, I don't. But we went over to Rock and Ronnie's house when David had read this article about, in the Times, about, because we were looking to try to make records or do something, and this guy was talking about authentic rockabilly. And I remember we drove, we were at, in Hollywood at the Denny's coffee shop uh, on Sunset, right as you get off the, the 101. And John Baz, I think, was there, and, and David and I, and maybe, maybe uh, Bill, uh, and they were saying, like, man, if we could just get over to this Rock and Ronnie guy's house. Somehow or another, we got Rock and Ronnie's number. And I, I called Rock and Ronnie on the phone from that place. I said, uh, I said hey, we play authentic rockabilly. <laughs> and... <laughs> and and he says, well, I'm getting ready to go to Europe. Uh, I have, you know, Rick Hampi and the, uh, the Rockabilly Rebels, and, and, and I'm saying, I've got a guitar. I'll come over and play you authentic Rockabilly right now. And he goes, well, if you can get here, and he gave us the address, and I think that the address may even have been in the, in the, in the, in the paper in the LA Times. And we drove over to Rock and Ronnie's house, and he had a gate that was closed, and the first guy that we saw walking out was Jackie Cochran, Jackie Lee Cochran, who is just so good. And he walked out and he got in his car. I think it said Joaquin, you know, that's, that, that's his name. Yeah. Uh, and Rock and Ronnie came out and he had a truck driver was picking up all of these records that he was taking over to Europe. And I had a tape that we had made. Uh, in fact, I think James Hartman, I don't know if James had recorded this one yet, I, I, maybe so, uh, of us playing what we play, you know, uh, I, and, and, you know, all kinds of different names for music. And before Rock and Ronnie opened the gate, I had my Epiphone guitar, and I think I played Mystery Train or Tiger Man or something on it, and that's when he says, okay, I'll listen to this. And so he took us inside <laughs> the house and we put the tape on, and he's listening and he's really going. He's going, man, this is rockabilly. And I'm going, man, why do you say it's rockabilly? What are you, what are you <laughs> saying? Why do you say that? And this great truck driver who was from Inglewood, a very good cross-cultural city, you know. <laughs> and he was going in and picking up these records and coming back out. And, and I said to him, and he had even still had, you know, sort of a, a quiff, you know, what, I, what we used to call quiffs. Right. And, uh, uh, and as he was walking back, he, was, he, he asked, he says, hey, what is this that we're playing? And Rock and Ronnie says, uh, this is uh, 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 some, this is there. I, well, I may have said it. This, it's us. And he says, well, I like that. And I said to him, I said, what do you call that kind of music? He goes, rhythm and blues. And, and that's when I, that's when I was selling Rock and Ronnie. Man, the guy's from Inglewood, man. What are you, <laughs> why are you with this rockabilly stuff? So Rock and Ronnie wanted to know, did we have originals? Of course, he wanted to know that because of the ruthless publishing agreements that record companies have made and that even though legally they're not supposed to be able to link the publishing to the record company, they do. And I was just learning about the publishing company. Uh, in fact, oh my God, I've got too many stories to tell. I'll tell you one of the ways that I learned about publishing before the so-called inception of the blasters. 
we used to drive up and down the coast and play at the piers and stuff and make money and, and then just live in the Toyota and, and, uh, and I, and T-Bone Walker, who was another friend of mine, a very good friend mm -hmm. of mine. Most of what is the blasters, save David, you know, was T-Bone Walker's backup band as well as Joe Turner's, you know? And, wow. And that's the fact I would call, I thought that the blasters, what, the blues blasters, I thought it was, I thought I remembered seeing it on a Joe Turner Atlantic record, but it's Jimmy McCracklin. And when we would back up Joe Turner, sometimes we'd be the Fly Cats, which is another band that he'd had, or we would be the Blasters. Because I, 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 you know, I took blues out of everything because it was just too restrictive, you know? Right. Uh, and not that the blues is restrictive, but people's restrictive. And so, and that's when the, the name, the Bla how the name the Blasters came about again in a certain continuity even though I had quit playing music for a while to do math, uh, to, to try to, anyway, we won't go to that. <laughs> At any rate, uh, David, who had always been a songwriter since he was three, and I would sing them and he would write them for my mother, you know, and, and, and. Uh, so you and your brother were a musical team from the start as far as that yes, is concerned. Yes, yes. Yeah. I say yes. And we used <laughs> to put on radio shows to get, I mean, we, we are very close, you know, and brothers, some things are the same and some, you know, you, you match up, some things you give. So as David and I were driving home from Rock and Ronnie's, we were saying, okay, and that's when I was saying, it's American music, you know, God damn it, it's American music. And, and we, David says, okay, we'll write a song called American music. And then the flat top joint was about Bell Gardens and, uh, you know, and, and places like that. And, and, and most of those, so I, and then, and then I, I said to David, I said, write a song that's got the yelp from Grandma Moo. Eh, ha, ha. That's where he wrote Marie Marie. Uh, and, uh, uh, and that's when Rock and Ronnie put out this record. And then they heard Marie Marie and Shaken Stevens, this guy. And I think it was Art Fine uh, uh, that had hepped Shaken Stevens to mm -hmm. it. And then it became a million seller over in, in Europe, you know. And, and that was the first Blasters record, American Music, off, off of that. That's right. Off of that that's record. correct. Yeah. And that's fucking hippie bullshit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, so, so then that's just the start of, of now the long Blasters career. But you learned a lot of valuable lessons talking to these old cats, like when Joe Turner was talking about the royalties. I mean, you were able to go into this a band now if you were going to go business-minded with this band. I'm not sure if you were even there yet, but you already knew a lot more stuff than most other players I knew by dealing with these. I am a terrible businessman for myself. I'm terrible, and many people right. are. Sure. If I'm doing the business for other people, I'm very good. We don't want to go into, I mean, we don't have the time and to go into what things came up and what, what people didn't know about. I had already been in bands for a long time by the time that the Blasters, as well as Johnny Baz and, and Bill Bateman as well. Right. At any rate, uh, uh, yes, many things happened along along those lines, uh, and and now and now I went over to Spain and died, and and oh, gee, they yeah, saved that's... my life, and now they're killing me. <laughs> oh, now that is that is one hell of a story. And let me just set this up by saying that when the Blasters are out of town, there's a band called Rumble King, mm -hmm. and Bill Bateman plays drums for that band. Mm -hmm. And when you guys are out of town, I'm Bill Bateman. That's right, filling exactly. in Rumble King. So when you were on this last Blasters tour, we started getting, I, I went into like a practice or showed up for one of the shows or something there. Like B Bill left some crazy message. We can't make heads or tails about this. Something about Phil Alvin dying in Spain. And all of us <laughs> were about to play. And that band plays five or six sets a night. You know, sure. So we're, we're stuck at this thing, just panicking and going, what the hell, what? And in the time difference, there was another message till like three or four in the morning, the next morning from Bill. So we're all panicking, having to play this show, going, what the hell kind of phone call was this? So why don't you tell us about that story? Because obviously you're here and we're so happy that you're here. But yes. we didn't know what was going on. We just heard that you died in Spain. Yeah, well, I, okay. I won't go into my, the, the MRSA that happened in my knee in November of 2011, all because of being a, just a tough guy. I had a bad knee. At any rate, we had to cancel all of kinds of, of road trips 
since November. And we finally, you know, everybody said, oh, your knee is, you know, Mercer is all cleared up and everything's good. And so we went to Europe to now make some money, you know? Yeah. Because I hadn't worked since, at any rate, hadn't worked, you know? And right before I had had this bad knee infection, I'd had an abscess tooth. And I had no health care or anything like that. And anyway, the abscess, I, I, I stuck a needle up in it to uh, pop the capsule. I know, man, whew. it was a very hard thing to do, but I did it because the pain was too much. And that did a certain kind of relief. And, and then I didn't think about anything again because I'm a tough guy, a big tough guy. As we were going, getting on the plane, the day we were going on the plane to Spain, to San Sebastian, uh, I felt my teeth on this side hurting. And I thought, oh my God, if this abscess comes back, you know, I'm going to be over there. And then, of course, I knew that they had some kind of health care over there, which I, one time I got it's like strep throat in Italy and they just gave me the pills and they said, go away and everything's fine. You know what? Great. So we, we went to San Sebastian, which is up in Uskalan, you know, where the, the, the Basques or the, the Vascos, who call themselves Uskaloons. That's their names, you know. That, and, it's a good name. It's a good name, man. <laughs> who've been there for longer than anybody's been anywhere in Europe. We played a, a, a festival the night that we got there in, in uh, San Sebastian, and then we, were, we had like two days off, and, and then we were driving down to play in Valencia. And on the second day, I remember telling Johnny Bass, yeah, I didn't remember this until after all this stuff happened, that I, I'm feeling kind of sick, you know, and that I'm going to go back to the hotel and, and lay down for the rest of the day. And, uh, and I did, and I felt better, but again, I'm, you know, I'm an idiot, a tough guy idiot, you know. So the, the next day we drove five hours or six hours to Valencia, which is just a phenomenal set. All the music in Spain and the, and the cultures in Spain are just phenomenal. <laughs> just a phenomenal place. We got to Valencia and we played a set. And on the last song, as I was singing One Bad Stud, the right side of my throat, I mean, instantaneously just went bloop, blew up like a balloon. And I'd never had anything like that happen to me. And, and I, but it, the song is kind of high, especially at the end, and it made it easier to sing the song. And we hung around for about an hour and a half, even though this right side of my throat had blown up to a balloon. So as we got in the van to drive back to the hotel, I told John Baz, I said, hey, I think I'm gonna maybe have to go to the hospital, but I'll go sit down in the, uh, uh, oh, dang it, uh, sit down in the hotel room and try to get straight. Well, I went into the hotel, as soon as I walked in, my left side of my throat blew up and I was sucking air down my throat and I can do it and I could have done it until they got me to the hospital. I went to the, I knocked on Johnny's door, said, I've got a good guy, I call ambulance. He called ambulance. The police came and, you know, and I'm anaerobic. This is what I do for a living. I just suck in oxygenless air and I, and I blow it back out. So I was just concentrating. And when I needed to breathe, I would suck the air down my throat. The police thought that the ambulance was taking too long and took me to a clinic that was near La Fay Hospital, even though there's a lot of time to get from the... And I remember walking into the clinic door and the guys at the clinic thought that the best thing that they should do was knock me out and shove the pipe down my throat to respirate me. Mm -hmm. They knocked me out. They couldn't shove a pipe down my throat. At which point I went on 17% ox oxygen for like 15 minutes while they took me to La Fay Hospital. As I got to La Fay Hospital, I flatlined. And this brilliant and skilled intern Dr. Mariella Anais Sifuentes, against her professor's orders. You know, it was a warm night, and most she clubbed me back into existence, took me upstairs where I flatlined again, and she clubbed me back into existence again and performed a tracheostomy on me. Huh. And I woke up a day and a half later in the ICU room with a hole in my throat, but nothing was wrong with me. She couldn't believe it. I, I mean, I, I first thing I saw was John Baz, and then I saw Keith Wyatt, and then I saw these two very beautiful doctors, doctoras. You know, <laughs> got to get rid of that junk. Uh, 
And Dr. Mariella, who I later became, found out was Dr. Mariella, was saying, you know, impossible, impossible that he couldn't be respirating and his blood pressure couldn't be stable. My blood pressure, is, doesn't matter what it looks like, you know, it always looks like I'm on a methamphetamines and everything <laughs> like that since I was a kid, you know. My blood pressure is always perfect. I don't care. They always would take it twice. My blood pressure was perfect. My respiration was perfect. She was saying, I can't believe it. They had done brain scans of me. They had, nothing was wrong. I felt fantastic. I had just been put under anesthesia for uh, this clearing out of my infected knee. Another tough guy, idiot. I'm an idiot. I am an idiot. I'm an idiot. And, 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 <laughs> and proud to it? say it, man, you know, <laughs> I'm an idiot and I got to stop doing this stuff. And, and, uh, I had been an anesthetized, you know, through my life, but I had just recently been anesthetized. As soon as I came back and I saw the blasters and the first thing I wrote down was, I'm sorry. And, and then when I found out that I had flatlined and I had come back from existent, uh, come back from whatever, I didn't see any lights, you know, I saw nothing. Right. And as, I became, as things started coming on to me and I, and I saw the love that I was being given and then all the people that came and, uh, and uh, I feel much more responsible for whatever reason that anybody cares about me and I, and, and I made me care about myself more. And, you know, I've been through a lot of death with my parents and, and ruthless death and, and, and so many other people. And it's always the case that, you know, it's for the living that all of this horror, and that's where the responsibility lies, uh, is for your responsibility to those who love and care about you. Well, it takes an experience like that sometimes. I hate to use such a cliche line, but like a life-changing event or a life-changing experience. It may have just caused you to just look at things a little different now because uh, of, you know. It, it well, it, 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 it did, it caused me to, to understand some things that I'd always understood. When I had this MRSA attack in my knee where I, I went to bed at nine o'clock at night and the last thing I said to myself, and I think I might even have said it to a friend of mine, God, my knee hasn't hurt in three months because I've had a bad knee since I was 14. And I woke up in the morning and my knee was two sides of two people's heads at four in the morning. Uh. And the pain was immense, it was so horrible. And one of the nice things about being an atheist is you can cuss out the non-existent God, you know? <laughs> like, well, what are you doing? <laughs> Sitting around in a bunch of blackness, and this is what you came up with? You're gone, and, and you're blaspheming and doing all this stuff. And the pain wouldn't go away. It was getting worse and worse, so the only thought that I could have was that I hope this doesn't hurt so much in the next second. The pain was immense. And then you start to go, well, maybe I had overstated this, you know, to the non-existent God. Uh, yeah. And then my good mind caught me. And it said, no. Philip, bring this wisdom, because you can't really remember pain. Bring this wisdom back from the edge of this pain that was, I was, I was ready to pass out. I was like, and I just pass out, you know. You can take a rational being and put them in enough discomfort and pain to make them believe in God. Sure. I'm going the other way. That makes it, that, that also makes perfect sense yes. to me. I yes, and then, I, a and, and I, and then I, didn't, I didn't take my own advice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's why I'm an idiot, but I take it now, honestly. Good. Well, and you should. Well, these are some amazing experiences that, I, I mean, I, I hope I would never have to go through either one of those I hope I can impart some of that wisdom to you. But, but I don't know that we can impart some no, wisdom. Some things that, are just learned. You just have to deal with it and yeah. learn <laughs> from the experience. And that yeah. is apparently yeah, what you did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me ask you. Here's All something right. that, I, that I, I like to ask of everybody. Um, this, you know, we're in Los Angeles here. This is what we're, you know, these, you're a Los Angeles-based player. I'm Los Angeles-based. Everyone we've talked to so far is L.A.-based. Uh, so, and I know your history with music, you've given a great detailed history with these old blues cats and where you've learned music and what you've taken with you from these guys. Now, my question is, do you think that Los Angeles has a sound, a music sound? Is there a specific thing about Los Angeles that causes 
what happened here to happen here musically? Well, the, the, you, you, know, you don't need to have a sound to have a place that is a good nurturing place for music. And I think Los Angeles, as well as just about any place else, but Los Angeles is a multicultural and, and has been so for a long time. You could talk to blues guys and say, well, that's LA is junk blues. You get all, you get, name it your mammy. I don't care what it is. <laughs> Los Angeles is right now and has been for a long time. And I think particularly right now, a very nurturing place for music. In the words, and I don't, I can't say exactly what he said, but in the words of Blind Boy Paxton, when I was picking him up to go see Captain Jeffrey in the Chum Buckets, he said, Ain't that a bee? A black man and a Pollock going to see a couple of Mexicans play jazz. And that's, <laughs> and, that's and I will leave it at that. And, and brother, brother Paxton put it more, more indelicately than that. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Only in Los Angeles, I guess, right? <laughs> I think it's all over the world now. Yeah, it is. And it I really think is. That, that, that the blasters should change their American music this is global music, and we know that now. And it's from our archetypes. And it's not even poor people's music, but there's not that many rich people. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I love you guys, all of you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Thanks, Phil. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for oh, talking man. to us. Yes. Mean, the stories are amazing. It's yeah. so great to have I you. I got a million more. Oh, I know you do. <laughs> yeah. Lay a sleeping, a cool breeze came a creeping, blowing honeysuckle, sent all through my room. When I was warm from above, by the breath of my love, smelling sweeter to me than that blue. Gripped tightly the knife she brought to the bed where we lay. She said her psych had just told her uh, she's probably bipolar and she hopes this don't go the wrong way. She said her psych had just told her she's probably bipolar sometimes it's hard to tell wrong from the right and now she's out on a mission cause she's got a suspicion of that high she did on her last night and if it's true, how could I do it? And if it's not, then we'd get through it. But either way, she saw trouble on deck. Always talking, always faster. From disaster to disaster. I felt that cold steel tighten up on my neck. She said her sight had just told her she's probably bipolar. And though she wants to, she just can't let me up. But she would soon let me go for her. This all would be over when I could answer her questions. While I keep my mouth shut I rolled quickly To save my life Fighting her for the knife With my right hand I smashed her And to her right she fell 
I stuck the knife in the wall before she'd finished her fall. Then she called the police on her cell. Now I'm downtown in this jail. No money to go my bail. Wonder just how the jury's gonna vote. Although I might be a cheater, does the law let me beat her when she's holding a knife to my throat? I mean, she's holding the knife on me. I hope I don't have to serve one to three. Good. 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 That was a good pass. Yeah, good job, man. <laughs>